study here from the Lake Tarpon Springs Church of Christ. If you have your Bibles, we'll be looking at Acts chapter 17, verse number 22. Acts chapter 17, verse number 22. Let's get a word of prayer. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you so much and thank you for this night. Please forgive us of any sin that may be within our lives, knowingly or unknowingly, whether thought, word, or deed. Please have mercy on our souls as we deal with all the things that transpire in our daily lives, Father God. Lord, we pray that you will help us to put it under the cross, behind the cross, and continue to look to the hills which come with our help. Bless all those who are struggling in any kind of way, shape, form, or fashion. May your will be done in every situation, in every life under the sun. We pray for the leaders of our nation. They have a great weight of responsibility to lead a country with many people in the direction, Lord God, and we pray that it's the direction that you will lead them in not for selfish ambition. Father, we pray that your will be done in our country as well as other countries. Uh, we pray that you be there for those behind the prison wall. Thank you for opening back up the ministry inside the prisons that we can share our faith and help those who are sitting in a dark place to have uh, a bit of hope, Father. Father, we pray for those in our congregation that they be strengthened by the leadership, those who you put in place to feed your sheep. Father, we pray that You'll work in and through us to do that. Bless the youth that are growing up in his dark times and all the trouble that they, they face growing up, Lord God. We pray for a hedge of protection around them as well as ourselves as we seek to serve you wholeheartedly. Father, be with us during this study and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my God and my Redeemer. In Christ's name we pray, amen. O oh, victory, O oh, victory in Jesus. We have victory tonight. And the victory lies in none other than Jesus Christ. And we're getting ready to read about him in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 22, where Paul is going to address the, the area of Athens. In fact, verse 22 says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Arabicus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one, it's a capital O, the one whom you worship, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. So they worship many gods in this area, but he noticed this inscription that says to the unknown God, but he's saying the one that you don't know of, I, I know about him and I'm gonna explain him or proclaim him to you. God who made the world, and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, 
So if you're worshiping a God that you believe dwells in the temple, then you have the wrong idea about God. Nor is he worshiped with man's hands as though he needed anything since he gives life to or gives to all life, breath, and all things. So God doesn't need us. We need him. And he has made from one blood every nation under men of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each of us for in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring so a lot of things transpire within these verses that we can touch on and actually spend a lot of time on it we're just not going to do it tonight but you can spend some time on it if you chose to well verse 24 the god who made the world and everything in it is spoken about in the book of genesis so if you want to study the book of genesis for those that don't believe god who he is or says he is then it will show you in the book of Genesis how God created everything. Verse 25, nor is he worshiped with men's hands. God doesn't need us to worship him, even though we should worship him for who he is. We, God doesn't want us to worship him as if we forced to do it. We should be willing to do it because, again, he's the one that created the world and everything in it. Verse 25, nor is he worshiped with man's hands as though he needed anything since he's the one that gives to all life, breath, and all things. He's the one that gives us life. He's the one that gives us the air to breathe. And he has made from one blood every nation, everyone came from Adam, Adam and Eve. Everyone came from Adam, from one man, to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined. Here's what people have an issue with. He has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. God is the one that says, your time's up here on earth. It's time for you to come home. It's time for you to meet your maker. He has pre-appointed these times. So when you hear people that passed away, you hear them say they died before their time. That's a lie. They died, they died when God wanted them to come home. Everyone has an appointed time. They were too young to die. No, no. God put a time on their life. We don't know it. They don't know it. But God has a time stamped on everyone's life or when it's going to be their last day on earth. We don't know how it's going to end, but God said this. It's right here. He has determined or literally set in place their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Where are their dwellings? On earth. He's not saying your dwellings are in a certain house because you're liable to move as we did growing up from house to house. The majority of our lives, you know? No, you're dwelling here on earth. So God has pre-appointed a time where your number, so to speak, is going to be called. And then now it's time for you to meet your maker. Well, what about if they haven't obeyed the gospel? Well, if they have a, a retardation or a mental illness, right? And they're not responsible for responding to the gospel because they can't comprehend what that is. I think God has a certain place for them. Babies, God has a certain place for them. People who are not at the age of accountability. Like my grandson, he's three. He's not at the age of accountability. Um, he can't, he doesn't, he can't understand that Jesus Christ died for him. He doesn't understand what sin is, you know. So if God was to take him home, God forbid, he's going to be safe and secure. But for us that understand who God is, that has the, the right to say, yes, I want to accept Christ, but deny him. There's going to be a pre-appointed time for us that God's going to call us home. And he's the one that sets this. That's why it says, verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord. Now's the time to seek God in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Yawn, grope, that anticipation, though he's not far from each one of us. Right? He says God, God is near to us. God is near to our hearts. Believe on him. He's close to us. For in him we live. So if you live apart from him, then you're not living at all. Because in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. 
Jesus Christ is akin to us. God is our Heavenly Father. He's speaking to those that need to know who they're worshiping. Verse 29, therefore, therefore makes application of everything mentioned above. Therefore, it connects what was mentioned above. Since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. We shouldn't think that if you worship a God, you know, they created carved images and worship them. You shouldn't think that God can be made out of gold, silver, or stone. He's a divine nature. We ought not to think that way. Verse 30, truly the times of ignorance, listen, God overlooked, but now commands all men or all mankind everywhere to repent. Why? Because if you go back to verse number 26, remember, therefore connects. So everything mentioned in verse 20, I'm sorry, chapter 17 from the beginning up to this point is all connecting. The, the, truly these times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? You can find the why not only in the whole chapter, but specifically in verse 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times in the boundaries of their dwelling. Now read 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all mankind, all men, everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day. You see that appointment? You can't get rid of the appointment. A day on which he dwell, or sorry, he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, which is who? Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. That's how we know we're talking about Jesus Christ. So now when I have a doctor's appointment, for some reason if I can't make it, I call up and change the appointment. You know, a dentist appointment, I change the appointment. An interview for a job or a business deal, whatever, I can change the, but I can't change the appointment that God has set for me to die. You can't do it. So when I leave the house, if it's my day, I'm not coming back. Right? So it's important how you leave the house. But we don't know this. It could be from a car accident. It could be from a stray bullet. I mean, I, I, I remember reading in the paper or hearing on the news that a guy was coming out of Ybor City, a nightclub in Tampa. And when he came out the, the club, he saw another gentleman and his friend arguing. So what did he do? He went up to the guy and hit him. The guy fell, died on the spot. So I believe that was his time to go and that was his way to die. But also, God was judging a person that did it because he did it out of anger. He did it out of pride. So God took a life, but also is trying to get another life to repent because maybe that guy can get right. See, we don't know. I'm not saying I know how God works. I'm saying this, that God has appointed everyone a time to die so we can't say they died too early. No, they died when God wanted them to die. Or, or we may say, well, why did God take the good person? Why did God leave the, um, and leave the bad person? Well, we can't determine why God does what he, why didn't God take us? The, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. When we sin, we deserve to die. But we didn't die. So what God is trying to tell us in his word, and Paul is trying to explain to them that God overlooked our ignorance. Now it's time to get right with him because we don't know how long we have. In verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Some of them didn't believe the resurrection of the dead, especially the Sadducees, but the Pharisees did. So they mocked. What do you mean, raised them from the dead? So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Denisimon, or Diasimus, the Arabagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So again, when we preach and teach God's word, when we're in church and the message goes out, everyone's not going to come to Christ. We should just get that in our minds, even though we know they should come to Christ. But let God work in their heart. Our job is to show up to fellowship, 
to share word, to mix and mingle in the spirit, to meet and greet, do our part. The rest is up to them. But they don't know if they're going to have another chance to hear God's word. Because he said God has a point in the time. So that's on them. But the ones that do believe, we welcome them to the family of God. Chapter 18, verse number 1. After these things, after what things? Everything we've just read in chapter 17. From Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. Let me reiterate that when you see parenthesis, parenthesis is not inspired even though it's in God's word. That's an add-on by, by the writer who wanted us to understand the sentence. So if it just said, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, and skipped the sentence, and came to them. So because he was of the same trade, you see, we need that parenthesis in there. The reason why they left is because Claudius, who was a ruler, had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Now, and he came to them. Who? The Apostle Paul. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation. They were tent makers. So Paul was a preacher and teacher, but his occupation was to make tents. So there's a lot within these couple of verses, and let me just name a couple of them. In the book of Acts, we had the foundation that started all the other congregations. Priscilla and Aquila are gonna be with the Apostle Paul. He's gonna teach them some things. They're gonna start the church in Corinth. You see, everyone that we meet and greet in the book of Acts, they're gonna, Paul's gonna reach out to them. They're gonna go back to their own area or stay where they are, here is Corinth, and then they're gonna start a congregation. That's why when Paul goes to prison, he writes to the Corinthians, he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he's writing to the church in Philippi, because he was there from the beginning, and he loved them. So this is the first part. And he reasoned in the synagogue, verse four, every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. So the Jews didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. Why they didn't believe it? Because they didn't think that God would come down in the form of a man. Right? And then be crucified on a cross. The way he did, they're like, no way. But Paul is saying that was the Christ. Because there was no one pure to die for our sins but the Christ. And they blasphemed, meaning they spoke ill will against God. Blaspheming is saying the GD word. Blaspheme is saying, you know, God doesn't exist. We, we came from apes. Blaspheming God is the Big Bang Theory. Blaspheming God is saying, you know, God can't be real. If God was real, then why this and why? That's blaspheming God. So people blaspheme God. We should do what the apostle did. Shake the dust of off, off our feet and say, you know what? Now your life is between you and God. I'm out of here. Yes. That's what he did. I want to go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus the ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his household and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and was baptized. Here's the key. So if they heard, right, they heard the word of God, how could they hear unless they have a preacher? They heard the word of God, which we're hearing tonight. They believed in what they heard. We even believe that God's word is the inspired word of God. Not only did they believe it, they responded to it through the waters of baptism. Baptism, baptismal, means to be submerged, um, plunged, or dumped. Not a sprinkling, not a repeat after me, a sinner's prayer. No, they, they, they heard the word, they believed, and were baptized. So exactly what they did in the first century, God has no respect of persons, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Jesus Christ is, so why would we think it'd be any different? 
So guess who's lying to you? The televangelist. If you want to accept God in your heart, then repeat after me. Who's lying to you is those who teach Catholicism. You know, it's just a sprinkling. Well, that's not baptismal in the Greek. That's not a submerge. You can't be submerged with a sprinkling, dunk with a sprinkling. So here is what they had to do. And we have the book of Corinthians. So why would we, we be any different? It's easy for people to do it the other way. Verse number nine. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. Well, what do we have here? We have here that the Lord said he's with the apostle Paul. And then what did it say in the book of Matthew? Call his name Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. So since God is no respect the person, God is with Paul, God is with us, and we are united in one. Let's keep going. And verse number 11. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word among them. When Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So here's a lie here. He never said anything contrary to the law. He just told them they must believe in the Christ. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. So tell me the wrong he did, and I'll be with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look into it yourselves. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. He didn't want to get involved with this. See, he knew the truth. Then all the Greeks took Sothenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. We'll stop right there. and We'll go back to verse number 18. Lord willing, next Wednesday. So what do we have here? God said, I'm with you. Keep preaching the word. God is with us. Keep sharing your faith. Keep living for me. I have many people in the city. We have brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world. So you're not the only one going through the battle. Keep doing it, and God is with us. Keep moving forward. They don't want to hear it. Whatever, we keep moving forward regardless. But God is with the Apostle Paul, and God is with us. So we must keep moving in the direction that God is leading us. And Lord willing, we'll continue with verse 18, if it's God's will, next Wednesday. I pray that this message was a blessing to you as much as it is to me. In Christ's name, amen.